Mark's Gospel, the ninth chapter, the 23rd and 24th verses. Brother Nathaniel, Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 12. Brother Jesse, John chapter number 10, verse number 10. It is so good to see you all in the house of the Lord tonight. Uh, it was great to be able to pray the prayer of faith after anointing folks with oil. And we believe because the remedy has been given through the word of God in the book of James, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. And also by his stripes were healed through his word. He sent his word and he healed them. Healing is available tonight. I believe that. There's some of you battling in your body. But I believe that during the preaching of the word of God, that you can receive healing tonight if you'll just reach out and get a hold of it through faith. Not because of my preaching, not because of who I am, but because of who he is and what this word means to both heaven and hell. What this word means to both heaven and hell. The victory is yours through this word of God. All right, Brother Nathaniel, Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse number 12. Would you read that, our brother? Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It was about 5 p.m. today when I heard the Holy Ghost bring that scripture to mind. Most of the time the Lord gives me a little more notice of what I will be preaching on sometimes five to seven days ahead of time, sometimes two to three days before I'm preaching. God has already spoke to my heart. I'm following the leading of the Lord. But today about 5 p.m., two and a half hours before service, Brother Rocap, you will recall that I sent you a text at 5 p.m. so you can relate to the time of day that I speak of, and I believe I told you that we have two and a half hours until service time because I was amazed at how clearly Hebrews chapter number three and verse number 12, the scripture verse that Brother Nathaniel just read came to mind. And I'm gonna ask Brother Nathaniel to read that verse again. Hebrews chapter number three and verse number 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. If y'all will notice over the last couple of weeks, the Holy Ghost has been speaking to us and reminding us of sermons in weeks gone by. The desertion of a disciple. And I don't understand exactly how anybody could turn back, but right there is a warning and a caution. And we have been alerted that potentially there's somebody in this building tonight that an old, nasty, ugly devil is going to try to turn you around in the near future if he's not doing it already. I want to preach to you a message that the Holy Ghost titled at 5 p.m. today, Ugly Unbelief. There is no spirit as ugly as unbelief. Ugly unbelief. Brother Jesse John, chapter number 10 and verse number 10. The thief cometh not before to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. And may I say, do not be enchanted by the ugly serpent. For he cometh to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. How many of you all heard about that man? I believe it was in the Philippines that noticed his wife did not come home from the fields. This happened recently. And he noticed that she did not send him word. He knew that was unlike her. And he sent a search team out and himself went looking for her with them. And Brother Tyler, they found her tools. They found her shoes. They found her poncho. I believe it was in some rice fields. And uh, they noticed that there was a slithery serpent's trail and marking that he had been in that vicinity. Some hours later, they found her in the belly of that ugly serpent. I pray that nobody in this building be found in the belly 
of the ugly spirit of unbelief. May we stand tonight for the preaching of the word as we read our text. Mark chapter number 9, verses number 23 and 24. The Bible says, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And so we know why faith is so important. Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house. We pray that you would anoint this thy servant, set a guard at my mouth, and help me to say the things that you would have me to say, nothing more or less. Anoint the ears of this thy people that they might hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. God, and I pray that you would thump that old ugly serpent of unbelief out of the way of this person or individuals that is going to be dealing with the Spirit in the near future or perhaps whoever's dealing with it this night. I pray that you would remove it and help them to remove it from their life in the name of Jesus through faith. Help us not to be hearers only, but doers of the things that we hear this night through your word. Not my words, but through your word. And may we depart this place joyfully and not sorrowfully. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Amen. Reading our text again, St. Mark's Gospel 9, 23 and 24. The Bible says, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Our text is found in a New Testament book of the Holy Bible, the book of St. Mark. This book of St. Mark is the second of four Gospels. The title of this book bears the name of its author. Most of you in this building tonight are very familiar with the author of this Gospel. In fact, in recent months, I've preached quite a bit about John Mark, and we know that John Mark was one that was no stranger to the ways of the person, Jesus Christ. We know that he was no stranger to the ways and the acts of the apostles. This was a man that was very familiar with the apostle Paul. He was personal friends with Peter. You've heard me in sermons of yesteryear talk about how that this blessed man was blessed because of his mother and how she would have those prayer meetings at the house and how she would pull on the cords that led to the prayer bells of heaven and how God would hear that woman's prayers and the others that were in those prayer meetings. And God would move mightily for John Mark's mother and for the other saints that were gathered together. And truly we can say that Mark's mother was a believer. We can say that from what we believe that Mark himself was a believer. And truly all of those apostles that St. Mark had as their heroes, people that he looked up to. Without a doubt, he would say they were believers. I wonder how many unbelievers are in the building tonight. We look at one another and we feel like everybody truly believes that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. We believe that everybody in this building believes that this is God's word. But for some reason, Sister Hammond, not everybody believes it enough that they would honor him as God. Not everybody believes it enough that they would keep his commandments and fear him and serve him and worship him in spirit and in truth. So there must be an ugly spirit of unbelief somewhere in the lives of two or three. Because if it was not present, we would all be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We would be doing spiritual exploits in his name. Because through faith, all things are possible. And that's why this father and his son were being attacked by this ugly spirit of unbelief. So the disciples of Jesus Christ believed that he was deity, that he was the Messiah, God incarnate, God in the flesh dwelling among men, and that he had come down to be a blessing 
to humanity. There were some who believed him to be exactly what he professed to be, while there were others that were unbelieving. They just did not get it, and they did not receive it. In the ninth chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, we see Mark's record of a time when the Lord Jesus was teaching, and while he was teaching, he was approached by a man that had saw that his disciples, meaning Jesus' disciples, were not yet completed in their faith. And because they were not yet complete in their faith, they were unable to do what the man needed them to do. They did not really possess what they proclaimed to have. And I know that there's a lot of people within Christendom and Christianity today that are professors, but they're not possessors. And we find that right then and there, this father found the disciples, those within the immediate circle of Jesus Christ, not to really be believers. And I know that there's a lot of people that prayed for the sick tonight, and you say, I believe. But do you really believe? I believe. And if I don't believe the way I should, I say, Lord, help thou my unbelief. And so we know that these disciples, at some point, they begin to believe that Jesus was, in fact, the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the Word of God, we find Jesus commending Peter because he had not been listening to the ugly spirit of unbelief. And Jesus said, Simon Peter... The Father and the sweet Holy Ghost has revealed to you that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Peter stopped listening to the voice of this ugly spirit of unbelief and had tuned in to the spirit of faith. And I believe that Jesus made it clear to all of humanity during that time. And he's attempting to do the same thing today. He reveals to us the purpose of his mission. The Bible reader present tonight knows this chapter gives the detail of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Something spectacular had happened in front of three very special people. Not all of the assumed believers of Jesus Christ were allowed to go to this mount of transfiguration and watch this spectacular event unfold. There were only three that were in the inner circle and it seems to me that they are no longer entertaining this spirit of unbelief. They believe Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God, and because they have the faith in this, they begin to witness the glorious transformation of Jesus Christ from being in a natural body to taking on a spiritual body. And so he allowed some of the faithful believers within the boundaries of his circle to see him in his glory while living here upon this earth. You see, during this spectacular event, Moses and Elijah appear and are standing next to him two great pillars within the Jewish religion Judaism appear and are present when Christ begins to reveal himself and who he really is in the spiritual realm we see that it's not just three followers that are present but some of the very pillars of Judaism have been there all along the Bible spoke of how we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses but I don't understand why so many people give up running this race it is a race of faith and we're going to have to continue running this race day by day one step after another one foot picked up and it put down and another foot picked up and put down I know sometimes we don't exactly understand the direction that we're going in that's because we walk by faith and not by sight there's the devil here in this ninth chapter attacking a father's faith I feel like in this building tonight there's somebody under attack by Lucifer's hitchmen. And if you're not careful, you will allow your faith to be shaken. This ugly spirit of unbelief had attached itself to Peter. At one time, Jesus said, I've been praying for you, Peter. And I prayed that 
lines of faith will not. He talked about Peter being sifted. He talked about Peter being stirred. And tonight there's somebody under the sound of my voice. If you're not careful while listening to this ugly serpent of unbelief, you will find yourself having your foolish heart darkened. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house tonight. That is why there's so many that have fallen by the wayside. It's because as Eve of all, they've allowed themselves to be lured away from the house of God. To be lured away from the Spirit of God. The only person that will hold ultimately is you. You think you'll hurt us. The devil hurts you. When we forgot you in eternity, when there is no place for the mourner, when there is no order for the backslider, the only person that will be stuck and lost in the belly of hell, in that ugly serpent of unbelief, will be you. You try to hurt my feelings all you want to. You can threaten me, you're going to backslide all you want to. The only person that's going to hurt is you. If you want to be enchanted by that old ugly serpent of unbelief, then you will be charmed by it. And I've never been one to be wooed by those nasty things in life. I've never been one to fall at the oozing lips of the seductress. I've never been one to fall at the pharmacy's gods. I've never been one to fall or falter by various things that the devil presents to the people of this world and the children of God. But the truth is, every person in this building at some point, this ugly spirit of unbelief is going to come by your way. It's going to whisper in your ear and try to make you tune out the preacher. Make you tune out the word of God. Cause you to tune out the people of God. You remember that spirit said, to Eve. Has God said? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this building tonight. Brother Nathaniel, I can tell that I'm just about flying solo in preaching this message because it's so ugly spirit and it likes to bring constriction on the atmosphere. You remember whenever the great man Apostle Paul was being fruitful in ministry, there was this particular woman, if you would, the serpent that attached herself in a parasitic fashion to the ministry of Apostle Paul. And she would go forth saying, this man can preach like nobody else can preach. You need to listen to him. This man is saying something. This man is called. He is somebody that has heard from God. But the Bible said that Apostle Paul discerned that it was not the right spirit. And it was not a spirit that had come from God. But it's a spirit that had come from this world. It had come from hell itself. And Apostle Paul addressed it directly and called it out and rebuked that spirit of Python. I'm telling you, there's nothing in this world to me as ugly as an old serpent. If you could really see how ugly unbelief is, you would never be enchanted by that spirit again. You would never entertain the spirit of unbelief. You would not listen to one lisp that it speaks. You would not listen to one hiss that it whispers. You would rebuke it. You would resist it in the name of Jesus. When you start questioning everything, Hath God said? Yeah. 
Like Jesus told the devil. He answered that question. Yeah, I said it. It is written. Centuries later, Jesus had the answer to that question. That ugly serpent of unbelief appeared in man's beautiful garden and began to sow the seeds of doubt. Hey, there was no longer only faith springing up in the garden. It was not only a time of sweet communion between God and man. It was not only the blessings of God on every corner. But now they're dealing with questions. They're asking questions that come out of the belly of hell. You have to be able to tell by now where it comes from. It comes from hell when it's questioning God. Well, I'll just backslide. Then maybe I'll hurt somebody. Is that how you operate? Right. You like to hurt somebody that loves you? Right. That's what that spirit was doing to this father's child. Right. So at the Mount of Transfiguration, wonderful, glorious things are happening. If you would, the church is in revival. The pillars themselves of Judaism are present. The lawgiver Moses is there. And the prophet of prophecy, the prophet of fire, Elijah is there. Also, there's the three pillars of the New Testament present. And Apostle Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Because Judaism is morphing into Christianity. And Jesus is showing himself to be in the center of all all things. Jesus was in the center of Judaism. And Jesus is in the center of Christianity. No matter who allowed that spirit of unbelief. Let me clarify. No matter who let that ugly spirit of unbelief tell them. He is not the Christ. He is not the Son of God. Why in the world should we follow him? No matter who faltered and failed there were those that were faithful there were some brother Jeremiah that just believed it they believed he had to be God's son because they believed what they saw they believed who he was hey come on now believing is seeing do y'all remember that sermon that I preached recently? The more they watched Jesus, the more they believed. But I want you to know that whatever Jesus told Peter, there's something going on inside of you now that should have been happening a long time ago. You recognize who I am. I'm telling you, I don't understand how people can visit a school in this church or a wonderful power-packed people and see the handiwork and the masterpieces that God is fashioning by his own hand and they seemingly cannot understand that it's God's doing. It ought to be marvelous in their eyes. They ought to know that it's God, but they choose to disbelieve it. I thought before, if they could only receive it, if they could just only believe it, that God can use a man to lead people out of captivity. That God can use a man to call down fire from heaven in a good revival service. If only people could really believe that God can take commercial fishermen and make them abandon their occupation and begin to fish for the souls of men and make them a priority. Do you know why the gospel has suffered the way it has and received so many opposers, those that have fought against it, Jesse? It's because people refuse to believe it to be the gospel of Jesus Christ and they refuse to believe that 
that Jesus is the Son of God. I heard a person who lives on God's green earth say this week already. He said Jesus was not the Son of God. Well, that's the spirit of Antichrist. He has certainly been wrapped up by something other than being wrapped up by God's grace and inside of God's gospel. You see, I believe, Brother Nathaniel, that in Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse number 12, the Apostle Paul was writing to Jewish people. Even though his focus had been on Gentiles. At this point he is reaching for the Hebrews. Which are the descendants of Abraham. And he's trying to put an emphasis on the fact. That Jesus is the Christ. The son of God. And you better not let these false teachers. Talk you out of your faith. And you better not let your faith. End up shipwrecked. I cannot imagine. What. Ian did to so many yachts over there on our west coast but I do know what the devil has done to so many souls in the haven of west there's a lot of people who shut off the dark and drifted aimlessly in the winds of unbelief only to find themselves in a storm oh God help us here tonight if you want to blow every way the wind goes if you will go that way and this is what came to me so clearly Hebrews 3 and 12 take heed he's saying listen to me y'all remember the sermon titled I need a hearing aid take heed comma you better listen to what I'm saying and at this point he says take heed comma brethren comma he says at this point you're my brother because you believe like I do that we had to go on unto perfection. Apostle Paul had been a Judaizer. Apostle Paul had believed in Jehovah God. Apostle Paul perhaps had been a member of the Sanhedrin. Apostle Paul was a protector of the Judaism religion. But Brother Caleb, he's telling these men, we now have a brotherhood only because of the common denominator, Jesus. And he's saying, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What Brother said, how turn we again to the weak and the beggarly elements of this world? When Jesus beheld a bunch of people turning back and going away from him because of his preaching, being so direct, his instructions, being so specific, and his word being so hard to some while others it wasn't too hard. For some the yoke was too heavy. To some the yoke was just right. To some it was so light. It's a whole lot easier than the yoke that we had on us while we were held captive and enslaved in Egypt's land. Oh yes, I'm telling you the best life that I've ever lived is the life that I'm now living in Christ. Thank God for old time salvation and old time conversion. I'm glad I've traded masters and that I can say I'm no longer listening to that spirit of unbelief I realize it's heaven or hell oh come on now I know we say holiness or hell but when it gets right down to it it's heaven or hell so do whatever you want to let your emotions run wild let your feelings guide you let that heart that's in you that the Bible said is so desperately wicked. Who can know it? There is nothing more deceptive within any being than their own heart. I'm telling you that heart can lie to you. You can walk throughout the day believing something to be true just because it come to mind and you laid it to heart and when you come home you're so sure that it took place and then I'm telling you God and the angelic beings of heaven knows it never happened but in your mind it happened. Do you know why you did 
deal with things like that it's because of those lying spirits and those ugly spirits of unbelief you've got to have faith in your spouse you've got to have faith in your church you've got to have faith in your God Must there be in any of you, brethren? Take heed, brethren. Must there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief? That's where we get this word ugly, a wicked, a nasty, a vile heart of unbelief. Do you know when your pastor begins to exhort on things and he spends an entire Wednesday night service talking to us about things when you choose to listen to that ugly spirit of unbelief and you don't give the more earnest heat to the things which you have heard. You begin to lose your grip on the words of faith, on the words of truth, and you find yourself being enveloped in the spring of a serpent. One rap at a time. One wine at a time. One service after service. Another service and another service. You find yourself getting wrapped up in the stronghold of unbelief. This is why when I see it in the word of God, I receive it. I'm telling you, you better receive it with faith. In departing from the living God, and I'm going to go somewhere right here. That man could not figure out what was wrong with his son. There could come a time in your life if you don't stop toying with that serpent that you've got caged. You feel right now that you're in control of that serpent and that it's just a game. Like the great generals Abner and Joab played one with another. You feel like you go out and you come in again like Samson. But I'm telling you slowly but surely, the serpent and the shears of Delilah, that ugly spirit, is clipping away at that long faith that you've got, that separation, that vow of sanctification, that that makes you different than the world. Every service, if you're not careful, disbelief every time will eat away at the foundation of your soul. One way it comes in. What callous develops into two. It turns into three. It turns into four. And then you get past feeling where you've got an evil heart of unbelief. I want to believe. But I can't. Apostle Paul said concerning some, you used to believe what I was saying so well that you would have given me your own eye. You had so much confidence in my testimony, in the miracles that you witnessed. You were such a supporter of holiness, righteousness, truth, and faith. But somebody got in your ear, some mother and father that used to live it, but don't live it anymore. Some preacher up the road. That's what Apostle Paul was doing when he specifically addressed the Hebrews. He's addressing God's people. It's supposed to be the cream of the crop. And he's saying the false teachers are going to come in and slowly but surely they're going to tear out your heart of faith. You better be careful getting on the phone with those that know what you're trying to do. There's nobody despises Samson's sanctification like Delilah does. There's no serpent despises Eve's walk in the garden of blessing like Lucifer does. I'm a preacher to somebody in this building right here tonight when you lay on that bed at night 
and you entertain them ungodly spirits and you start asking am I in the will of God am I following the voice of God am I doing what God told me to do is this really necessary this is going to make me an oddball in society this is going to make me stick out like a sore thumb that's alright Daniel that's alright Shadrach be shocking a bit this world in our home anyway. You know why I don't have a problem letting it be long. You know why I don't have a problem living holiness because I know that Babylon is not my home. You don't realize you're not in control of the serpent. The serpent gets control of you. All it takes is one preacher to decide, you know what? I don't feel like going to church. How many of y'all have heard that story of that 35-year-old man that called his mother and said, Mommy, I don't feel like going to church tonight. Now, God gave me all this at 5 p.m. today. But, Mommy, I don't feel like going to church tonight. He did that the next week, and he did it again. Brother Nathaniel, the story goes like this. After the third or fourth week, Mommy said, Well, George, you've got to get up and go to church. And he said, Why is that? She said, Why, George, you're the pastor. Slowly but surely, he was getting wrapped up in the words of the spirit, the ugly spirit of unbelief. You can get to the place where you play so much around the spirit of God. You get familiar with the spirit of God. You get careless with the spirit of God. And then you decide to reach out and touch it like as a did. And you find out there was nothing to play with. I want you to know the serpent's nothing to play with and neither is the spirit of God. Oh, thank God for the Holy Ghost. How did this man's son Get in the spiritual shape that he was in. Because it's more than a physical ailment. It's more than Parkinson's disease. It's more than a seizure. I heard of a young man that died early this week because he tried to quit drinking alcohol cold turkey. You know why he died? He had a seizure. If he had just had the Spirit of God instead of a seizure, he wouldn't have shook himself to death. And I'm not trying to put him down. I'm just telling you the Spirit of God can help somebody quit cold turkey. But people don't believe in James chapter number 5 anymore. They don't believe that we can call for the elders of the church and that we can anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith. And that God will save the lost. That God will heal the sick. And if needs be, God will forgive the sin of the sinner. And God will raise the dead because of a believing people. I heard somebody say that one of the great mothers of Israel in the northeastern part of Georgia died recently. I think it was her grandson was saying that he one time got sick. I believe it was a month after his wedding. He said his grandma called him and she was speaking in tongues for four to five minutes uh, praying that prayer of faith uh, for his healing. Uh, I'm telling you all uh, that we can get back to the place uh, where we wept and cried uh, and said thank God uh, for a praying church. Uh, thank God uh, for a praying pastor. Uh, thank God uh, for a praying people. Uh, you don't realize what you got uh, until you lose it. Yeah. 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 I feel that myself. You don't realize what you have until you lose it. You heard Sister Wooten talk about how she drove 10 hours once a year just to have her soul fed because there was no functional holiness church in LaBelle, Florida. Now you know why she shouts like she does, whether she feels like it or not, whether she's limping or not. Y'all do remember a few months ago she's having a problem with that foot. I've seen her shout on it. I don't know if she's healed or not, 
But from what I can tell, they sure don't seem to be bothering her as bad as it was because she did not entertain an evil heart of all belief. It's ugly. It's ugly. It's ugly. It shows up in ugly attitudes, ugly spirits, ugly temperaments, ugliness. That's all it is. Ugliness. In departing from the living God, it takes an ugly person to depart from their spouse. In the Bible it said, for the young man to take heed to his spirit, that he deal not treacherously with the wife of his youth. I think it would behoove us young and old alike to take heed to our spirit like the apostle saying here. And not let our spirit deal treacherously with our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe that he is Christ, the Son of the living God. It doesn't matter what commentator, what talk show host, what charismatic leader, what church pastor, what worldwide evangelist says that Jesus is not the only way. The word of God said he is the only way. I believe that. An ugly spirit says otherwise. This man had been a good husband. A real good husband. But he was never one for PDA. I recently figured out what that is. Public displays of affection. And they do say those that have the most outward PDA, public displays of affection are usually the ones that have no private displays of affection. And that's true. So he was a great guy. But he was never really overly loving or kind or thoughtful. Consider all of the things that that beautiful woman done for him over the years. And Sister Wooten, it came time to bury her. She died unexpectedly. And then he realized what he lost. And so he went to the undertaker to pick out a tombstone. And while he was there, the undertaker was saying, what should we put? On the tombstone. What should be the inscription. On the tombstone. Loving wife. Loving mother. Prayer warrior. What? And the man's eyes. Filled up with tears. And for the first time. In his life. He had been honest. Towards her and everyone else. Concerning her. And he said she was much better. Than I thought. Once he lost her, he realized what a wonderful woman he had. Once we lost that pastor, we realized what a wonderful thing we had. When he dropped dead of a heart attack, we realized what a wonderful thing we had. When that mama didn't wake up that morning, you realized what a wonderful mother you had. Brother Rick Jacob talked about one of his grandfathers the night quite fondly. He said he'd spend time with us. He was affectionate toward us. You could tell that those are precious memories in the spirit of Brother Jacob. He could take you to a place and even tell you his age he was when he spent that quality time with his granddaddy. He said, I was six. I remember this specific instance. In my life with my granddaddy. Brother Jesse, you could tell that he was missing him. Spirit of unbelief has got a hold of a lot of people. And you'll see it in your lifetime. There'll be people that come by as if somebody's deceased. Secretly, they meant a lot to them. Privately, Sister Wooten meant a lot to them. As long as they could see her at Big V every now and then. As long as they could see her in Walmart every once in a while. But when she ain't there no more, they're going to realize what they had in a testimony of someone of strength. But why are they no longer with us? I preached it recently this past Sunday 
They went out from us because they were not of us so that it could be revealed or made manifest that they were not of us. Meaning they were of a different attitude, a different persuasion, different mannerisms. Where are morals at today? What happened to morals? What happened? Unbelief. That's the sin that God cannot stomach and tolerate. One of the many. He can't tolerate any sin, Jesse. But the fearful and the unbelieving will not be in heaven. In departing from the living God. In this chapter, the Apostle Paul was reminding believers about the Jewish people. After that they had left Egypt, been delivered from the iron fist of Pharaoh. Apostle Paul is talking about the wonderful things that happened within this nation's history. Do you know where the Apostle Paul gets his inspiration? From Psalm chapter number 95. Centuries prior to this time that Apostle Paul is preaching to Jewish believers. The Apostle Paul is referencing a song or a piece of poetic literature. In the psalm, the same message is being told what you forgot of the wonderful things that happened to you when God delivered you from Egyptian bondage. What you forgot about walking through the belly of the Red Sea on the ocean's floor and the floor of that ocean was not even wet. It was dry ground. You don't remember what happened to your ancestors whenever they got into the wilderness and entertained the ugly spirit of unbelief. How they hardened their hearts in the days of provocation. Do you not realize you put yourself as an instrument in the hand of the devil to be used by Lucifer and you make yourself an eligible candidate for demonic possession. When you miss one church service, when you pout, when you willingly choose to harden your heart, you are opening your heart to satanic oppression, if not demonic possession. How do they get there so fast? How do men fall so far? Because the serpent calls itself around them and drags them into his lair. That's how. You know what that serpent does? Pharaoh's serpent, his strong arm, pulls you back into slavery. You'll do things you thought you would have never done again. You'll start thinking things you thought you would never think again. I thank God that Egypt was once my home. And I'm so thankful I'm living in Canaan now. So we've got two ministers, the psalmist and the apostle, centuries apart, are having to remind people of where they came from and how wonderful the deliverance was and how, how much better they have it now. And then centuries after Apostle Paul, we've got a preacher standing in the pulpit using the same exact scriptural references, the same exact stories. The message is going to be the same. The Spirit of God is going to be the same. The Savior is going to be the same. The difference is some people are going to believe it and go to heaven. And not others are going to unbelieve. They're going to disbelieve and go to hell. You know what the problem was, Brother Jesse? They were thinking on other things and not thinking on things that matter. The spirit of jealousy. I'm going to lay out of church enough to throw somebody off. And then once they get out of church, I don't have to put up with them anymore. I'm going to tell you who's going to have flames of hell going through every orifice of their body. You are with that spirit. The Bible said it's better for you to have a millstone hung about your neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea 
The shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico are not enough for that spirit. The bottom of the Mariana Trench is where that belongs. As close as to hell it can get is where that jealous spirit goes. Well, if they see me lay out, maybe they'll start laying out. I'm going to tell every new convert in this church, you see somebody you got confidence and respect in, they start laying out, just know they'd rather kiss the lips of the serpent than kiss the lips of Jesus. Huh? Don't you let them drag your soul out of church. You just see it for what it is. And you pray for this sorry, backslidden soul. Because that sister Teresa Wallace was telling me about some backsliders this past Sunday night. She wasn't talking very long. But she said it don't happen overnight. Now I'm out of time right here. I got so much more to preach. But an evil heart of unbelief called some to fall away. An evil heart of unbelief calls some to fall away from the one and only God. In Hebrews chapter number 3, we're told in that same chapter to exhort one another, to push one another, to encourage one another, keep moving, keep believing, keep pushing. I mean, I'm here tonight preaching through an allergic reaction. You wouldn't know it unless you got close to me. On the way to church, I couldn't hardly breathe. Do you see the signs of it on my forehead? Is it still there? Has the anointing healed me? It's there. But the last thing I'm going to do is call in. Or call out. So when I walked out of my office, I said, well, we'll see if I'll have enough air to preach. Because my air passages are extremely narrow. But you know what? We'll just go ahead and preach. I had matter coming out of my eyes. I had a swollen neck. I'm telling you, Brother Nathaniel, it was worse than any neck ache I've ever had. The glands of my neck were swollen. I was hurting so bad, but I'm preaching. You know why? Because I'm not going to put a stumbling block in these new converts' way. But, but I believe that there is a spirit of unbelief in the land. Oh, it's an ugly spirit. Hath God said Apostle Paul said, I exhort you, I encourage you. Because if I don't, the enemy's going to use trickery and deceit, and your heart's going to be hardened. If you look again at our golden text, Mark chapter number 9, 23 and 24, you will see that there is a father who realizes his son is in fact possessed by a devil. A demonic spirit, but the father realizes he is a mess himself. That's what I wanted to get to. And then we'll close with this. The father realizes because Jesus points it out that this boy's problem lies with the father. Now that's very deep. And I do not need to preach another 30 minutes to explain and let you understand why that's the problem. Because you didn't pay attention if you ain't got it. The whole sermon up to this point explains the problem the father had unbelief i wonder how many church services he missed i wonder how many sabbaths he didn't keep i wonder if he was unfaithful because somebody really believes in god they believe he is and they believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This lets me know this father had not been diligent in seeking God. And his son is in this shape because daddy ain't taking it seriously. Your daughter being in this shape that you cannot imagine because you're not taking it seriously. The devil don't play marbles, but if you do play marbles with the devil, he's playing for keeps. I'm not looking.
going to win. I'll tell you who's going to win the game. You're playing with a serpent. The devil is going to win. It's not you against me. It's you against the devil. I'm the cheerleader in your corner trying to tell you how to win. But you're making it a war between you and the pastor. Some of you better go back. If you went to the bathroom for five minutes during this sermon, you better go back and listen to this sermon in its entirety because you might be missing something that's very vital to your spiritual well-being in the immediate future. I'm going to clarify something right here for everybody to see it. This spirit had caused that son to be suicidal. Right. The Bible said that spirit would make that child do things that child did not want to do. It would throw him in the fire pit where there was fire. It was not a fireless fire pit. It would throw him in the lake where there was water. And it would try to burn him in the fire and drown him because Brother Jesse read it, John chapter number 10 and verse number 10, because the thief, that old serpent that comes into the hen house, he come up for prayer to steal. The Bible said, and to kill, and to destroy. You would think stealing's enough. You would think hiding in the back closet would be enough. But no, he's got to choke the life out of it. He's got to constrict the glory. He's got to restrict the power and kill. And then when it's done, he's got to destroy that marriage. He's got to destroy their children. He's got to destroy that church. You're not getting this. The devil wants to destroy his victim. You're not getting it. The father's unbelief had caused this child's spiritual situation to deteriorate to the point of suicide. Come on, Pastor. It's there. Right. Because the healing hinges on the daddy. Your child's health hinges on you. Your child's well-being hinges on you. Spirit of unbelief. I'm not so sure. Y'all don't remember last Wednesday night? The way the Holy Ghost rose up in your first lady. And she said, they're going to hell. And then because of that spirit of unbelief that the Holy Ghost knew was here last week, and I just thought of this. So that's why God spoke this Hebrews 3 and 12 to me at 5 p.m. today and sent me barking up a different tree. It's because last week you did not believe it when Sister Harold said, they're going to hell. They're going to hell. For years, investigators have said, when the perpetrator is caught, they just been caught for that one offense. But there have been hundreds, if not thousands, leading up to it. That's why usually when a murderer is captured and incarcerated, they begin to question them because the pattern of the murderer is, I did it once and I'll do it again. And I want you to know the devil has killed many. He took them out of the house of God. He called up in the pew and dropped them right out of the doors of the church house. I've seen him do it. He'll kill again. Who you gonna believe? 